In today's show, Regina shows you how to handle your sweet tooth in a guilt-free manner with strawberry yogurt crepes and her own version of Bananas Foster called Bananas Campbell, of course. Regina tours the co-op in search of healthful baking alternatives and makes coffee lattes that are delicious, easy to make, and organic. Wine expert David Berkeley makes his wine selection of the week. Of all of life's little philosophies to live by, there's one I particularly relate to. It's the one that goes like this. Life short, eat dessert first. In fact, that's what we're going to be preparing today are some special desserts that do not rob you of good health and well-being because every one of them has healthful ingredients in them. And we're going to start with something particularly healthful and you don't usually see this in a dessert. Thank you, Chris, my trusty sous chef, Chris Cochran. We're going to be making a yogurt cheese. Now, have you made a yogurt cheese before? No, I've watched you do it, so I know how it's done. Okay, this is simple. Now, normally with a yogurt cheese, I'll lift this you, up so you can you see You take cheesecloth, you put it over a strainer, usually doubled, mm -hmm. just put it over something that can catch the liquids and let it sit overnight in the refrigerator. That looks like It's a coffee, a coffee filter, filter, and the reason we did this is because you, you're m probably more apt to have a coffee filter mm -hmm. around than cheesecloth. And just to show you, you can get creative about this. And look what happens. Oh, it just peels off. It just peels right, right. off. Okay. okay, and I want to show you something else. This, from sitting overnight, that's the amount of liquid that was in the yogurt to begin with. And so what we're left with is a wonderfully creamy substance. It's almost like a soft, like fromage blanc, a soft, a very fromage soft blanc. fromage blanc, which they eat a lot of in France, which basically is like, looks like yogurt cheese. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, it looks like soft cheese to me. Yeah, exactly. We're making a small order today because what this is going to go into are fresh strawberry crepes. And we have another healthful ingredient. It's wonderful. Strawberries itself. Mm -hmm. In this case, we're going to be putting a little sweetener in it because we're using it as a spread in a dessert. We're and going that would to spread be it honey. in. A, we're going to use honey. You can use sugar if you like. I, I like a little bit of honey in this particular dish. So just enough to sweeten it up a little bit. Doesn't need to be too sweet because we're going to be putting a little bit of liqueur. I was going to say, well, it is dessert, so yeah, it has to be a little bit sweet. Absolutely. Normal crepe recipes, you use simple ingredients. You use a little bit of flour, a little bit of milk, a pinch of salt, and some eggs. And what we're doing differently here is we're going to substitute some of the flour, and we use unbleached organic white flour. We're going to substitute part of it with some of this nut flour. This has a little bit coarser texture, but the good thing about it, it not only adds flavor, but it also adds some protein and some phytochemicals and, color, too, and color and such mm -hmm. um, to the crepes. It gives the crepes a much more interesting flavor, even if you're going to do a little crepe Suzette, just a little splash of sugar and Ooh, butter like and a little liqueur. You know, this, these really taste wonderful. So here we go. We're going to do, what, three, half a cup of unbleached white flour mm -hmm. and then a quarter of a cup of the nut flour and you can do the liquid cup. ingredients. You want the whole thing in? Yeah, the whole thing in. Three quarter cup of milk. And then about a quarter of a teaspoon of salt. Should be about right, and the a couple eggs. eggs. Yeah, and you can put it on the blender and I'll sit back and wait for it to finish up. Okay, the skillet's heated and I think we're ready to go to make the crepes. Crepes are really simple to make. The main thing is you have to make sure you have a non-stick skillet and then you want it over medium, medium low heat. I brushed just a little bit of butter in the bottom for flavor and also to keep it from sticking. Not that it's going to stick much in a non-stick. And you have to work quickly at this point. You pour a little bit in and then begin swirling it around the bottom of the skillet, unless you have a crepe pan, which makes it particularly easy. As Soon as you see that the liquid ingredients have dried up a little bit on this side and you have one kind of dull, smooth surface, then it's ready to flip. Okay, we're ready to take the first one off. And Chris, if you want to come over here and put a little plastic wrap over it, keep them from sticking together, I'll start on crepe number two. These really are simple. People are really intimidated by crepes, but for no good reason, because as you can see, this comes pretty quickly. Crepe number two, if you want to go ahead and put the plastic wrap over it, and we'll just do an extra one for safety here. We're only preparing a couple of these crepes fully, but it's enough for us to see if we can redeem ourselves from the last one a little bit. And here, you just want to take some of the liquid, bring it over, and boom, now you have a perfect crepe. And not only that, the crepe meisters in Paris do exactly the same thing. They have a spreader and they work it around from the sides and spread it till they get it perfectly even, so. That's not exactly cheap. 
Okay, we have the last one we're going to make coming off here, and we can go ahead and begin assembling it. And I put just a little smear of this cheese. And you know what's nice about yogurt cheese is because yogurt has a little tartness to it anyway, you get kind of a sour cream. This is not a little, this is a little too much is what that is. But anyway, it still has a little bit of that tartness you would get from sour cream. And everybody likes sour cream and strawberries, only this is more healthful. Stuff's wonderful. Well, you can and put a then, little bit of uh, lemon or something in there too. You can put, yeah, you can put all kinds of stuff in there. No limit. You can put spices. It's really good. I've done it with cinnamon yeah, and nutmeg. Cinnamon. You can do mm -hmm. that. We're keeping it simple and you can customize it any way You're you wish. You're doing this on half because? Because we're going to flip this other part over. And you can use either, I like to use um, oftentimes an organic, uh, unrefined sugar. It's kind of beigey. We yeah, don't have any on hand today, but looking. you can use any kind. So and we're this, using this powdered sugar. Confectioner's sugar? Yeah. Just a little bit of it. You don't need a lot. And finally, a little, let's see if I can do it with this thing, a little splash. You can use Cointreau. I like Cointreau. Although here we have, uh, I think we're using triple sec today. And where's our plate? There you go. And a little dollop of yogurt cheese. Thank you. A little dollop of yogurt cheese on top and spread some fresh strawberries around. And voila, you have a very helpful Dessert. In fact, this is really good for a Sunday brunch as well. If you want to do crepes for brunch mm -hmm. instead of, yeah, you'll see that there's, you're not getting a lot of carbohydrates in this. Is that okay? Can I get my fork? You can get your fork and you can start on it, but back there because we've got to clean up. We have another recipe. You know Bananas Foster? Oh, it's yeah. one of the richest, gooeyest, mm -hmm. most sinful desserts. We're going to take some of the sin out of it and make bananas, bananas Campbell. <laughs> <laughs> sure it's not Campbell's Bananas? Oh, Campbell's Bananas. <laughs> Meanwhile, you and the rest of the crew can share that one and we'll put another one together later, okay? We're going to start with some ripe bananas. You want to make sure the bananas have just a little bit of blackening on the little outside, spots little on spots them. happening to make sure you've got a lot of sugar, sugar in there because we're not putting a lot of sugar on the outside, and I'll tell you how we're taking the sin out of this thing, okay? Mm, taking it out? <laughs> yeah, a little sin out of it. Okay. It still tastes fabulous. Okay. You'll see. It's, right. it's worth it. Right. You know how with Bananas Foster, they have a skillet full of bubbling butter, and that's where you <laughs> yes. begin sauteing yes. these wonderful ripe bananas? We're not doing that, no. okay? So what we're doing instead is we're using these little nut buds. Yeah. These little, these Flavorful, little, crunchy, and healthful. Yeah. This particular one is almond. I think almond and pecan both go very well. And you can use and walnut. They go real yeah. good with These bananas. are the convenience items. You can finely chop walnuts or almonds or whatnot and use those as well. We're using a fair amount of these, enough you really want to coat the bananas, and then putting just a little bit of sugar in it. We only have a couple teaspoons of sugar as opposed to an Good entire pan full the, of it. The uh, bananas being pretty ripe have a lot of sugar in them. They already do, exactly, so we're going to capitalize on that. And then there is, this isn't exactly sin free or guilt free, we're putting it over a little bit of ice cream, but we are not going with the super high fat type. Okay, this but is all the butter that goes in here. A couple of tablespoons? Oh, something like that, just enough to coat See, we're going to run these very gingerly through our fingers here and make sure that all of the little nut nuggets are really coated. coated. And once they're coated, then we're going to brush the bananas with a little bit of egg just to make sure this all sticks and pat it in there. So why don't you make, here, right over here, I'll hand this to you. We'll put the finished product okay. in this little glass baking dish. And use just a tiny bit more because it crunches up really nicely when you have a little, a little butter in there also. Okay. Just give me a moment here. I'll be right with you. Okay. Now, I'm going to take the bananas. They're in. They're, split in they're split in half, and in a moment, it's going to be in quarters <laughs> because this is very. This is ripe and soft. Also, they That's bake better. You don't want. Egg. Yeah, you want the banana to soften up in the um, oven. So. Do you want to coat the other side mm -hmm. too? Coat the other side, and then we'll encrust it with the remainder on this back side. Okay, good. And I'll all you do is just one. pat, pat it on here. The residue will all fall off. And we're placing it in the pan, and we'll do this with all four of them. Okay, there we go. You That's want to fine. pop it in the oven? They'll go in at about 400 to 425. Pretty hot for, oven. Yeah, pretty hot oven for eight to ten minutes because pretty it's not short like time. just need to heat the bananas through. They're already plenty soft because they're ripe, and then get a little crisping on the outside. And then we'll come back and serve it over a little bit of vanilla ice cream. Chris, I'm sorry. Could you take it out of there? I'm sorry. I what? Forgot. I forgot something. So you know, that's a problem with TV cooking shows. You get so busy blabbing about this, that, and the other thing. Sometimes you forget some ingredients, and 
It's happened on more than one occasion, so we're going to try to make up for it. Cinnamon. No yes, it, it really makes a difference. Normally, you would want to put the cinnamon in with the uh, nuts and the sugar while it's in there. I don't think it's going to kill anything to do it this way, so instead, we're adding the cinnamon a little bit late. Yeah, a little bit of color on the top, too. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you for making it sound okay. <laughs> there we go. All right, that's the last thing? That's Nothing the else? last thing. Okay. okay, now that we have our act together here, I want to take you on a little field trip to the Natural Foods Co-op okay. because one thing I'm really big on is I do like to have my cake and eat it too. I love dessert, <laughs> but I want to try to make it as healthful as possible and still have the, the most wonderful flavor. So mm -hmm. there's really some simple things you can do to substitute out not unhealthful, but less healthful ingredients for more healthful ingredients, and we're going to show you some of the options. Personally, I love baked goods. My only objection is when you go into the store and buy pre-packaged items, oftentimes you don't know what's in them. A lot of chemicals and preservatives, so I prefer to make my own. The point of this little visit to the co-op is to see some healthful alternatives to some of the more commonly used ingredients in baking. we will go on a little tour. There are a few different substitutes for plain white sugar, and we're going to start down here with one called sucanat, which is, I, I particularly like this one. This is an organic dried sugar made from cane juice, and it has a more granular type of texture to it, and it is not as intensely sweet as refined white sugar. I really like the flavor of this one. So this is a good one to use, but you have to remember it's not as sweet, so you might need to adjust your ingredient list out a little bit in a baking recipe when using the sucanat. Now, another very commonly used one is a simple unbleached cane sugar that has not been through as many of the processes. This is the most similar to white refined sugar that you would find in a grocery store. And here we have an unrefined sugar, and this is the one that I generally have around. Let's take a look at it. You'll see this has not been bleached, it's not been refined. This is organic, unrefined cane sugar. And you can see the color is sort of beige. This is the one that I most often keep around for doing a, a, just a simple swap out on baking. Just use the same as you would regular refined white sugar. And also I keep it with a vanilla pod, a vanilla bean in there in the sugar bowl to have a little vanilla scented sugar whenever you're putting a teaspoon or so in your coffee or tea. So I like this one in particular as a simple replacement. Here we have turbinado sugar, which is getting a lot of play these days. They're saying it's not having as drastic an effect on blood sugar levels, but this is made out of a straight cane sugar. This looks very much like the other one you saw, the unrefined sugar. And fructose. Now, even though a lot of juices and drinks you'll see have fructose or high fructose in it, even though it sounds quite a bit more healthful, the reality is this is just a refined sugar product that comes from either vegetables or from fruit. In this case, this is out of uh, corn, and it's very intensely sweet like sugar is. It has the same kind of effect on your blood sugar levels. So don't think that because you've substituted out any of these for regular sugar that you're going to be any better off in terms of the rise and fall of blood sugar levels. That's pretty much stays the same, unless you're getting into some of the syrups, which we'll get to in just a little bit. And here are some replacements for refined white flour you would normally find in a supermarket, although you can find wheat flours there as well. Just to give you an idea, this would be the first replacement, simple replacement for white flour. This is an unbleached and also organic white flour here. And you can see it's a little creamy in color, not exactly, because it's not as processed as the others. it has been no bromide or anything used. It's just a good, basic white flour organic. And then we have many different varieties of flours we can use, um, organic and, and uh, conventional, either way. We have oat flour, barley, pumpernickel and rye here, even buckwheat. Here are some other possibilities for sweetening. I particularly like maple syrups. Just a good, unrefined, dark maple syrup, grade A, B, C. They're all good. It just depends on what time of the year they were harvested. Now, with maple syrups, it works particularly well if you're doing something of a liquid nature, such as smoothies or lemonade. And some of the things I featured in my show, you'll see me use maple syrup quite a lot. Another one, for example, it's not as liquid. It's a little thicker. This is a barley malt syrup. Okay, and then let me show you another option here, and that is a brown rice syrup. 
Now, when you're using syrups like this in the place of dry ingredients, there are a couple of things you have to keep in mind. First of all, they're not nearly as saturated with sugar as using a refined sugar as one example, the dry sugar, granulated sugar. So you'll need to use a little bit more of them than the recipe calls for. Secondly, when you begin mixing these wet sweeteners in with your dry ingredients, it's going to change the way in which the chemistry works. So you just have to get used to it a little bit. It's a pretty simple uh, ratio swap here for all of these. So you want to substitute one cup of sugar with about a cup and a half of a liquid sweetener, add about a quarter of a teaspoon of baking soda to get the leavening back, and then reduce the amount of liquid by three to four tablespoons. And that's, that's your basic ratio you'll be working with with these. If you can see the tiny writing here, you'll see that stevia is sold as a dietary supplement because it is supposed to have a beneficial effect on blood sugar levels, stabilizing them, but it is used primarily as a sweetening substitute. And again, just a tiny, tiny little bit of it because it's intensely sweet. And then honey. Finally, honey. Now, here we have many kinds of honey. Honey is also intensely sweet, and unlike the other liquid sweeteners here, where you'd use a cup of sugar, you would reduce the amount of honey to two-thirds to three-quarters of a cup, because again, it is very, it's a very intensely uh, rich tasting sweetener. So that's about all you have to do. Again, you want to put just a little bit of extra leavening in there with the honey as well. And just by a small amount, reduce the liquid ingredients in the recipe when you're using honey in baking. And this is essential if you're going to be doing any dairyless baking. This is called egg replacer. It's basically a powdered mix. You just add a little bit of water to it. It has no dairy, no eggs involved here. And once you whip it up, it it feels very much, it's nice and sticky like regular beaten eggs and it acts the same way in a recipe, whether it be cookies, cakes, batters and so forth. So that's, that's a good thing to have on hand. Now a simple replacement for butter in a recipe is simply oil, particularly if you're not doing a crust of any kind but more of a batter for a cake or for pancakes or whatnot. And in that case, Almond oil works really well, also sunflower oil. You want a flo an oil that does not have a particularly strong flavor. So I'd stay with an almond or sunflower or safflower oil, even a canola oil um, for your baking. And again, if you can, try to find something that's organic and unrefined. One thing I like about the Natural Foods Co-op is they list all of the ingredients in their baked goods, such as this little almond crunch cookie I've had my eye on. Thank you, Eve. One for the road, mmm. Okay, I know the grill chef needs a little bit of sustenance, so this bananas Campbell just came out. I'm going to drizzle a tiny bit of grade B maple syrup over the top. And, and grade B is better yeah. than grade A. Yes, well, I like it because it's a little more intense. It's for later theory. in the season harvest, so it has more minerals in it, a little darker. This is a very healthful dessert. You've just put a tiny bit of vegetable oil on the grill just so that it won't stick. And you can use any, any, any fruit you like. I mean, it really doesn't matter whether they're summer fruits or winter fruits, anything you like, you can put on here. We're experimenting. We've never grilled some kiwis. Of these things, yeah. So we have some plums, and we have a good um, ripe pineapple, and we have some red pears. We're trying mango, too, a little grilled mango. And we'll end up putting this on a plate with a couple other helpful ingredients for a really simple little dessert. Really ripe peaches over here. Hope they stay up there OK. High sugar content is good for grilling because that puts nice marks on it. Yes. And you don't want to actually cook them so much as just putting some nice um, grill marks on them. To finish this off, you did a masterful job. Look at these wonderful grill. We did find that the we mango were a little, was a little bit too uh, mushy. Didn't, a little didn't too make mushy. It and not only that, personally, I find the um, kiwi a little too acidic. But Everything that's else. That's just a personal preference. Great. And the way you finish this off is we have a little bit of whipped up chev, a very mild goat cheese and soft goat cheese. It goes really well with all of these. You can also use a fromage blanc. And then, if you like, you can put some nuts in as well. It's very simple. And then we've garnished it with some edible flowers. Some oh, that'd be a great end to the evening. Isn't that wonderful? Tastes very, great, looks very, great. Very, very, very simple and healthful type of um, finish to a meal. Now let's see what David Berkeley has to serve with this. And I'm going to guess he's going with the dessert wine. <laughs> Regina, you win the bet. Dessert wines it is. But you might be surprised that in some cases, I think that the dessert wine is the dessert best served alone. Now there's such a diversity of dessert wines available. 
And that doesn't include the fortified wines known as Sherry's, Ports, and Madeiras. There's also the category, which is quite exquisite, of those wines made from noble rot, such as the great French Sauternes, or maybe those wonderful late harvest wines from Germany known as Auslese, Birnauslese, and Trockenbirn. But as fine as these are, and there's many of those, I would suggest that maybe you should try some dessert wines from the world of Muscats. Now let's start with the lightest. Something like an Asti Spumanti. This is Italian charm. It is that wonderful green grape in fragrance and flavor with frizzante. Or maybe a California Muscat, one that is the essence of Muscat. It has that rich, luxurious taste. Maybe an orange Muscat. It's orange blossoms and heady perfume. And finally, an old brown Muscat, a liqueur quality from Australia. This is very rare, quite expensive, but exceptional. Try a Muscat next time you need a dessert wine. So Chris, would you like to get ready to plunge that coffee? You want it now? Yeah, go ahead and plunge it. It's been about two or three minutes since we heated up the coffee, and they say when you're making French press coffee, you want to get it to the point where it's just starting to boil, not where it goes into a really hard boil because it changes the actual quality and okay. taste of the water. So we have the coffee ready to go, and you can pour a little bit in here, and I'm going to talk, just, just tell a little story, just a little in an anecdotal bit. Years ago, I was doing some features on alternative health, different ways in which people around the world found healing. And sometimes I was dealing with folk healers, and other times, as in Germany, we were dealing with people in the medical profession, some physicists and doctors that had gone and expanded into alternative medicine. And there was one I was particularly struck by. And he was talking to me after the interview was over about the notion of good health and where good health really comes from. And he said that the majority of disorders of the human body, which, and this is something I've come to find a lot of truth in as time goes on, has to do with what you put into it in terms of your actual digestive processes. Okay. And whether or not you have put a lot of toxic elements into the body. Now, some people would say, coffee itself I was say, is toxic, is you know? Coffee toxic? It, it takes a little while to get through the liver and all, but that's not it. He said it wasn't the coffee. It was the amount of chemicals they put in the coffee. Uh, Try to go with the purest coffee you can find that has the fewest amount of chemicals. As in, like, organically grown? Organically grown. Okay. Ideally, organically grown. Then you're just removing that element. If you're going to put a little load on the liver with digesting the coffee to begin with and all the acids, which we love. <laughs> and if it's decaf, make sure it's water processed. Make sure it's water processed, and they also have... Um, they also have organic Swiss water process. So if you can, I mean, it's just another thing to think about because you're getting a lot of chemicals in the body even through our water sources. And you know, we'll, we'll buy bottled water and down it all day mm -hmm. long, but we'll go ahead and drink coffee that's been made and out of gray water. A, you should have a new or a, a real good uh, source of water for your coffee too, because you can have better that's, tasting coffee from the water, not from the coffee that's itself. That's the point I was getting ready yeah. to make. Start with good, clean, fresh water, mm -hmm. even bottled water or filtered water filtered out of the water. tap. Yep. So just to top this off before we What's say goodbye, that? this is organic milk. This is a frother, froths the milk up so you don't sort have to have like one of those a, big expensive cappuccino machines. Uh -huh. Look at this, it makes perfect froth every time, and that's that all the milk? effort. No, I've already heated it. Look oh. at that. Perfect foam. Oh, there you go. We have the perfect organic cappuccino. And on that note, we'll have a little sip and we'll say goodbye to all of you. Until next time, Sante. To find out more about Regina's vegetarian table, visit our PBS website at pbs.org.